If you want to, turn in your Bible, you can, if you have one. <clears throat> We're actually back to where we can actually carry a Bible again, right? And uh, you can use the Pew Bible also if you'd like to do that. And then turn to 1 John uh, chapter 3. <clears throat> We're looking at uh, verses 1 through 10 this morning. I think uh, the last song we just sang, I think you'll see how, how it ties in really well. Just so you also know, before I read the scripture and we begin the sermon, um, we do have uh, the communion cups and they'll be passed out to you. So when the praise team comes up later, they'll start singing uh, the first verse or two of a song and the elements will get passed to you during that time. And then after the um, first chorus, we'll share the bread together and then they'll finish the song primarily, um, well, at least the second verse and of course, third verse and of course, and then we'll, we'll take the cup together. So I don't want anyone to not know what's going on, but um, we'll pass those out to you in a little bit. Let's hear the word of the Lord this morning. <clears throat> See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. We shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. And you know that he appeared in order to take away your sins. And in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. Uh, no one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, and he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one of the one, excuse me, who does not love his brother, nor is the one who does not love his brother. The word of the Lord. This is not an easy passage. Um, there are a couple of uh, things going on here, so bear with me. And um, are you all familiar with this passage? Have you noticed that it seems, if you're not, uh, if you compare this with chapter 1 and 2, it seems like um, there could be some uh, contradictory uh, statements here, but that isn't the case, as we'll see. Now, years ago, um, there was kind of a thing out there. It was a question that was used in churches from time to time, especially uh, when preaching from a, a chapter like this. And you may have heard it before, but the question was, if you were on trial for being a Christian, you heard it? Would there be enough evidence to convict you? Have you heard that before? Yeah. Kind of a sobering thought, but um, yeah, I've heard it before too. So in this uh, chapter of John, as we begin it, um, we see a contrast again. He's using that style of uh, contrast, abiding in Christ or remaining in Christ, being like Christ, or uh, abiding in sin, practicing sin, being in a state or pattern of a sinful lifestyle. Uh, we noted in recent weeks this theme of abiding. So I figured I'd count how many times uh, the word abide, abides, abiding, and so on uh, appear in the book of 1 John. So I counted 21, which I thought was significant. Uh, chapter 5 is the only chapter where that word or, phrase, uh, or phrases are not used, those words. So in the context of chapter 3, uh, we see uh, again that John is reinforcing basically what or who a Christian is and who or what a non-Christian is. And so that's the comparison that we're going to look at this morning, which I think uh, is not a bad place to be as we prepare uh, for the Lord's Supper. I do want to pray with you. Uh, Dexter, it's very good to see you back. And uh, I see Rachel, I heard you got, had a skiing thing, so we're glad to see you as well. But let's pray a moment, shall we? Uh, Father, we, we thank you uh, for your word. May we... Um, May we grow by it. May we be um, 
And may your spirit speak to us through it. Um, thank you, Lord, for um, helping uh, Dexter so he could be here today and strengthening him and for watching over Rachel. Um, I also pray for Harold, who uh, usually comes to our first service that had, um, had a lot of surgery over the weekend, and it's going to be a lengthy recovery. Um, I pray for, uh, for Charlie, uh, Charles uh, uh, Chapman, who um, is also recovering from a stroke, and we thank you. Um, thank you for um, Alwyn Van Cor being back at her place, and also John Somers and many others. I pray for Bob Blazer. I pray for Trefina. I pray especially for Gina Gephardt also as she battles cancer. Uh, our hearts uh, go out to the Romanian, Romanian, excuse me, the Ukrainian people. And, um, and I'm also concerned, Father, for Moldova as well, um, a neighboring uh, state there. We're praying for your mercy, and we, we thank you for the miracles that have already uh, happened. And we just pray that uh, you might uh, bring peace, uh, that this would not be the beginning of something worse. We're praying, Lord, for your, your grace to us, and especially to the Ukrainian people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I, I spoke on the phone yesterday with Sergey. I mentioned him to you a couple of weeks. And uh, he and nine of his family all got out safely. And they are in Bulgaria. And uh, we had a nice long conversation. Thank goodness for interpreters. Because I'm not quite that good in Russian these days. But uh, we had a great talk. And he does have other families still there, as many uh, people here in the States as well. So please uh, keep praying. Um, uh, Word of Life, um, I was a student at Word of Life Bible Institute in, in 1978, I graduated. But they have Bible Institutes all over the world, including the Ukraine, and also in Romania, Hungary, um, Bulgaria. They have a presence in Venezuela, Argentina, Australia, all over, Austria. But uh, just so you know, um, they are converting their properties and their Christian camps into refugee uh, centers. So uh, Kathy and I sent them a gift yesterday. And um, if you are interested in doing some of these things, you'll be hearing more from me. Samaritan's Purse is also setting up uh, hospitals and places uh, in um, Poland to receive um, 1.5 million refugees today, uh, to date. So. Uh, this will probably be at least uh, going on for quite a bit. So uh, you might pray and ask God what it is that you can do. So please keep that in mind. Our outline is very simple. We're going to compare a genuine Christian, uh, verses uh, 1 through 3, verses uh, 6, 7, and 9, and also then what a counterfeit Christian. Sounds kind of like an oxymoron, doesn't it? A counterfeit Christian. But um, verses uh, 4, 5, 8, and 10... Uh, will tell us what the difference is. There are several uh, characteristics uh, given for the Christian here. You might note in verse 1, the first one is that the world does not know the Christian. And you can uh, phrase that in many ways. The world does not understand would be another way of saying that. Um, and uh, John says through the Spirit that the reason the world does not know the Christian or know us is because it does not know him. The two together, right? Um, if you know uh, Christ, um, then you're no longer a part of the world system. At least we're not supposed to be. And when I mean the world system, I'm talking not about being alive and having a house and work and family. We're talking about the, the other activities that the world um, tries to pull uh, the church and others into. But the world does not know or understand Christians. This is a restatement of chapter 2, verse 15. You might recall it said, love not the world, right? Or anything that is in the world. So a true Christian, John says, does not follow or live in a pattern, a state of or a pattern of the culture. The Bible says very clearly, and I may have mentioned this last week, that uh, we are in the world and not of it. And if God uh, basically didn't want us here after we received the faith in Christ, uh, we'd be taken up to heaven. But he leaves us here for a reason, right? To share the gospel and to live differently than the world to be an example and a witness uh, to the culture. So we're not to uh, live in the pattern of the world or the pattern of the culture. Again, if anyone loves the world, that is, if anyone has an attachment to the world culture, 
the love of the Father is not in him. That's very strong language, isn't it? The world thinks it's strange, the Bible says, that a Christian does not live and think in the same ways that, that the world does or the culture does. The Bible talks about having a, a worldview that is, you know, God is certainly at the beginning of that worldview, that we believe in a God who is sovereign and in control of mankind and everything else in the universe, and that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead to make a possible way for people to make peace with God so that we would then no longer be in the world in the sense that we are in the culture. We'd be living here, but not, not a part of the culture. 1 Peter 4.4 4 puts it this way, With respect to this, they, the world, are surprised when you do not join with them in the same flood of debauchery. We might say that the world thinks it's strange when we don't think and act the way they do. They think we should all uh, act and live exactly the same way. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the word of the cross is folly or foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. You see the contrast, don't you? There is a clear distinction, according to Scripture, between a Christian, a believer, a child of God, when compared with a non-Christian, a non-believer, and John says in verse 1, the world does not understand the difference. The second characteristic, he says we are God's children. We are God's children. Verse 1 again, we should be called children of God and so we are. Now we know the world says everyone. Everyone is a child of God. And what they mean when they say that is, you know, um, except for the atheists of course, but the rest of them, they're basically saying we've all got God as our creator. In a sense, God is our father in that he created us. But there is, again, a distinction between uh, being created by God and being children of God. There's a distinction made here. We are God's children, he writes, and we shall be like him. For everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. So everyone in that sense is not a child of God. They're just not. They're created by God, but not a child of God. Um, in order for you to be a child of God, again, John 1.12 says, as many as received him, to as many as believed on him, to them he gave the right to become a child of God. So we're not born as a child of God, according to that verse. That's why Nicodemus got all upset. He didn't understand rebirth, right? We must receive him as our Lord and Savior. We must believe with our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, that he is God, that he died and rose on the third day according to the scriptures. So then only a follower of Christ is a child of God according to scripture. Galatians chapter 3 says then that these children of God are grafted in to the family of Abraham. And we are Abraham's seed or Abraham's offspring as a child of God, a follower of Christ. As we saw in chapter 2, um, the true believer abides in Christ. Remember, 21 times in this short book, except for chapter 5, the idea of abiding or remaining in Christ is written. Now he adds that he also, uh, the believer will purify will purify themselves and be pure as he is pure. And he's talking about a desire to be like Christ. Do we have a desire? When we fail, hopefully we say, oh, I got, I got ways to go, right? But I want to be, that's my desire. Deep down in my spirit, I want to be like Christ. So verse 6 starts to bring about some verses that may be a little uncomfortable for us to to think about or understand. <clears throat> no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. Isn't that an interesting statement? No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. So I asked the first service, have any of you ever sinned after coming to faith? <laughs> you probably should raise your hand, all of us, right? 
what about Paul and, and Peter and all these wonderful early church leaders? Do you think they sinned after? Can we even read about that in the New Testament? Where they sinned after coming to faith? You betcha. That's a Midwestern thing. You can. Um, they had moments where they fell and sinned. Uh, Paul uh, wrote about it in Romans 7. He was very upset that he had a particular problem with covetousness, which, by the way, can lead to many sins. Um, I think Putin has the problem of covetousness. He wants something that doesn't belong to him. He's coveting the Ukraine. It says the child of God, verse 7, practices right living or righteousness. Verse 9, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning for God's seed abides in him and he cannot keep sinning because he is born of God. So it gets a little bit interesting, maybe a little confusing. What are these verses telling us? Again, we know that uh, Paul and Peter and others, that they occasionally perhaps, or sin certainly from time to time, and uh, violated God's law after becoming a Christian. Going back to chapter 1 and 2, we know that he can't be saying that we never sin. Because chapter 1 said that if we say we do not sin, we deceive ourselves, verse 8. But if we do sin, verse 9, right, he is faithful and just as we confess, he is faithful and just to forgive us, and so on. So look at chapter 1 and 2 where it says that we, we do sin, we need to confess our sin. How does that agree with chapter 3 when it says the child of God doesn't sin? There's a couple key words, of course, and a practice is one of them. Did you see that word, depending on your translation? It's really getting into uh, this idea of, of a state of being, a state of mind. Before coming to faith in Christ, I am a state of sin. I'm in a state of sinfulness without Christ. After coming to faith, I'm supposed to be now in a state of forgiveness, a state of redemption, a state of sanctification and purification and my desires should be different than when I was living in the state of sin. The desire uh, when I'm living in a state of Christ or of, of faith I should now desire the things of God. Yes the child of God does sin but this idea of that we continue exactly the way we were and have the same inclinations, the same desires to do wrong, in fact, that we want to continue in the state of sin while claiming to be in a state of, of forgiveness and faith, John is saying that they're not compatible. Does that make sense? What is the trajectory of our life after coming to faith? There should be a new trajectory, a new goal, a new place that we desire because we are now in a different state. We're in a state of forgiveness. So chapter 1 and 2 do not contradict. There is no contradiction here. Another point John is making, again, referring again to our standing, if you will, or our state of being. You know, there's only two choices according to the Bible. We get that, right? You're either in Christ or you're in the world. In the sense of you are still in a state of sin before Christ, I have no standing with God. I have no forgiveness for my sin. But when I enter a relationship with Christ by faith, asking for him to take away and forgive my sin, and I want to turn from my sin, and I ask him to be my savior to save me, I now pass from death into life, I go from a, a state of Christlessness to a state of Christ likeness. I go from a place of unrighteousness to a place of declared righteousness. So again, verse 9, when it says, No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, he's saying that, again, the direction of our life should have changed. He doesn't say that you will never sin again because then he would be contradicting chapter 1 and 2 
And I know there are, there are preachers who say that people can achieve perfection in this world. Have you met any? No, I haven't either. We'll keep looking, though. There are certainly people who walk in such a state of grace with God, and they are so uh, sold out to Christ. They are so uh, involved in prayer and reading the Word and uh, striving to serve Christ that they don't sin as much as they used to, right? And that's the goal. That's what he's talking about here. It's all about where we live. Are we living in darkness or are we living in the light? Are we abiding in the world or are we abiding in Christ? Are we choosing to remain in our sin or are we desiring to flee from our sin? Remember Joseph? The book of Genesis. So he... um, Potiphar's wife was uh, tempting him over and over and over again to sleep with her. And he said to her, I, I, cannot, I cannot do this against my God. And he literally had to run. <laughs> he had to run from that. So are we practicing living in the light or, again, living in darkness? Are we moving away from sin and moving towards purity, as John writes here? That's what the Christian should be doing. And if we falter, what are we supposed to do? Do we quit? Get back up. Yeah, get back up and, and confess and move forward. That, that's what we're to do. We don't wallow in, in our sin. There was a time when King David, again, I finished the, um, the Psalms of repentance, if you will, the seven Psalms. 51 is my all-time favorite. <clears throat> and it took David almost a year after sleeping with Bathsheba, getting her pregnant, killing her husband, not until he was confronted by Nathan the prophet, we talked about this in the men's study yesterday, Um, then he finally came to his senses. And I believe if we're truly in Christ, uh, we may falter, but eventually we, we will come to our senses. The Holy Spirit will convict us and cause us to come back. But let's talk about a counterfeit Christian. What are the characteristics? Well, verse 4 says they practice sin. That is, they remain in a state of sinfulness. In fact, they are comfortable where they are. There is no desire to get out of a state of sin. There is no desire to become a Christian or a follower of Christ. Again, the preaching of the cross or the gospel to them is foolishness. They see no benefit to knowing God or believing in God or coming to Jesus Christ by faith. There's just no benefit for them. They want to stay right where they are. Verse 5, uh, it says that he appeared to take away sins, but they are still in their sin. Now, Jesus had mentioned this to the Pharisees in John chapter 8. It's one of those chapters where the Pharisees take a beating from Jesus. He really lashes out at their hypocrisy because uh, the Pharisees in several places in the New Testament, they really felt that they were sinless. Did you know that? They believed that. Remember when the man that was born blind was healed and then they kept asking him how he was healed and they kept telling him the same thing. And then uh, he went a little too far and he said, oh, do you want to follow Jesus too? (laughs) As they were throwing him out of the synagogue, they said to, to this man, you are still in your sins. How dare you talk to us this way? The implication is, you're a sinner, we're not, so you don't talk to us that way. And so Jesus in chapter 8 does a couple things when it comes to the Pharisees and the religious people. He tells them that uh, they are of their father, the devil. And if you go to 1 John chapter 3, it says, if, if you're not in Christ, you're still of the devil. And that's what Jesus said to the Pharisees. 
And then he said this to them, you are still in your sin and you will die in your sin unless you repent. You're still, in your, you're still in a state of sin. You're still in a state of unrighteousness. Now, they thought they were in a state of righteousness. Jesus says, you're not. Because all they cared about were regulations and power and control of the people. They were not earnestly seeking God and certainly not his son. Then verse 8, again about a counterfeit, says, whoever makes it a practice to keep on sinning is of the devil. In fact, John is saying there is no middle ground in spiritual matters. We are either in the family of God or the family of the devil. Wouldn't you like a third choice? There isn't one. The Bible doesn't give us one. Jesus said either we are for him or against him. So I don't know if the Doobie Brothers, Jesus is just all right with me, would cut it. I, I, I don't know. Good song. But. Now verse 10 says this, By this it is evident, or it is clear, who the children of God are, and who the children of the devil are. Whoever does not practice righteousness, that is those who are not in a state of transformation and declared righteous by God, they are not a believer. Okay? And then he kind of adds uh, again about the one who does not love his brother. That's also a test. This is a tough passage, folks. It makes us uncomfortable. I'm glad we get to conclude and go to the Lord's Supper because it's a difficult passage. But sometimes we need to feel uncomfortable. You know that? When I read the Old Testament, I get into Leviticus. Uh, I just finished that. I'm in Numbers. There, there are some passages that make me uncomfortable. A passage like this, it seems to imply that as a child of God, I'm supposed to be perfect. But we know he's not saying that. But yet many have fallen into the trap of saying, wow, I'm a Christian. I'm supposed to never sin ever, ever again. I've, I've blown it. Wow. I'm in trouble, you know. I'm so thankful for chapter 1, verses 8 through 10, and chapter 2, verse 1. What he's really talking about is our standing. When we've passed from death to life, when we've received Jesus Christ as our Savior, we will not be brought back into the darkness. Amen? We might mess up from time to time, but we are still, in God's eyes, declared righteous. We are in a state of forgiveness and righteousness, even though there are times when I, I think about some of the things that cross my mind or I say, I go, you got to be kidding me. I still had that thought after all these years? Isn't it amazing how we can be tempted, even after being a Christian 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years? It comes down to, what is my desire? And if you've been a Christian for any length of time and have struggled with personal sin or convictions or temptations, it comes down to, don't we desire to get rid of that? Because most of the people I talk to who admit that they're struggling with something, they don't want to be there. Charles Spurgeon was once comparing as we get ready for communion here. Someone asked him about this. And, and the idea was the difference between a hog and a lamb. You might know the difference. So in, in, in John 3, one represents a believer, one represents the non-believer. Obviously the lamb represents a believer. And Spurgeon said this, he said, if, if, if a pig goes out and uh, gets all you know, rolling in the mud and everything, and you wash the pig, guess what's going to happen? He's going right back into the mud, isn't he? But if you throw a lamb in the mud, or he falls into the mud and you wash him, is that lamb going back to the mud? No way. Because the lamb is not their nature. Do you get the point? If you're truly in Christ, you may fall in the mud, but again, when we, are, when we confess, we don't go back. We don't want to go back to that place because we're a lamb and we're not a pig. <laughs> so I want you to think about that. 
I just want to read one last passage, and it's, it's tough, but I, it's sobering in Matthew 25, but I think it's, again, for us to review. And when we come to the Lord's table, we are to reflect on our faith. And again, we, we, lay our, we, we bow our, our knee right at the foot of the cross, and we reconnect with our Lord for his, his gracious death, burial, and resurrection. But in Matthew 25, again, he's talking uh, between the Christians and the counterfeit Christians. And he says to the counterfeit Christians, depart from me. You are cursed in eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. It was not prepared for people, the lake of fire or hell. He says, depart from me, you cursed into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was stranger. You did not welcome me naked. You did not clothe me sick and in prison, and you did not see me. And they will answer. These are the counterfeits. Lord, when, when did we see you hungry, thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? And he will say, truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did it not for me. All these will go into eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. This passage, as uncomfortable it is, it brings those questions. Am I a counterfeit or am I real? Which state of, of place am I in? Am I in a state of, of redemption, a state of declared righteousness by God, or not? There's always a time. This is what we, we come to church for. We come to reflect on our relationship with Christ. We come to seek his guidance, his forgiveness, his mercy. And so as we close in prayer and prepare for communion, I just pray the words of John will speak to all of us as we prepare uh, for the Lord's table. Let's pray a moment. Father, we pray uh, for all who are here in this service. We pray that you give us comfort, even uh, from a difficult passage that we would reevaluate. And Lord, if we know our desire is to remain in you and to be in a state of righteousness, Lord, help us when we fall. May we confess and return stronger than ever as we try to carry out uh, your decrees and your direction for the church and to live a life before you and this world to draw men and women to Christ. Help us, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen.